okay, so um, okay, so let's get going. Um, so this is happening as uh, as part of a, a, a seminar series. Um, uh, so the Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. But one of the nice things about running these online seminars is that we can um, do experimental things and meet up with other groups and so on. Um, and so this week it's a couple of talks uh, in the kind of overlap area between logic and combinatorics. So this has long been an, an area where there's been lots of interaction, maybe going back as far as, you could even say as far as Ramsey in the 1930s. Um, and it very, seems very natural to have a seminar afternoon uh, in this area. So uh, our first speaker today is Tamar Ziegler. Um, uh, maybe I'll just hand over and say, uh, um, uh, welcome and let's get going. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> by the way, how long is, how, when should I stop? Um, to aim for something approaching an hour, would be great. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, right, so uh, thank you very much for having me there, or not there, or here. <laughs> um, I, uh, right, so um, what I want to talk about actually um, is, um, I, I practiced this sentence, but it won't come out right. So it's, I <laughs> uh, uh, actually want to talk about um, a result or results in algebraic geometry that um, are motivated by questions in additive combinatorics and are proved um, via model theory um, using analysis in finite fields. So yeah, I'm, I think I managed, <laughs> I managed, to, say, uh, I managed to say what I wanted, um, um, but I wanted to have a disclaimer first. So um, I'm not uh, a logician, nor am I an algebraic geometer. So um, probably there are people who um, in the audience who know a lot more about whatever I'm, some things I'm gonna say than not probably not all, <laughs> but than I do. But, and I probably uh, will say some wrong things and abuse notations and, uh, and I apologize, uh, I apologize in advance for that. Um, that's it. So with this introduction to myself, uh, now it's not working. Okay, it is. Um, so um, so my, the setting, um, the setting that, that I wanna talk about is, uh, um, so I, K is a field and, and we look at the ring of, uh, of uh, um, polynomials and n variables uh, over k, um, and basically the, the the things I'm interested in are um, what can be thought of as kind of stability properties of ideals and R, um, by which I mean properties that are independent of the number of variables. So um, I'm give you um, so one I give you two examples. One of them we're going to focus all the talk about, but the second one. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a nice example that attracted recent um, attention. Let me, there's noise outside, sorry. Um, uh, is, uh, is the following. So, uh, so suppose you have, uh, you're given a, a collection of C polynomials, Q1 through QC in, in, uh, in N variables and homogeneous polynomials, then there is a well-known theorem called the hilbert syzygy theorem um, that says that uh, if you look at the ideal generated by Q1 through QC, then it is of projective dimension at most n. So by which it means that um, there exists a free resolution uh, with length that is with length k that is as at most n. Um, so the LKs here are, are, uh, are free modules. And there was a conjecture um, that is called the or there was because okay, I'll, a conjecture is called the Stillman conjecture from about 20 years ago that um, that said okay maybe I should say about the there there are examples where actually you do need um, you do need the the full length n resolution so but there was a conjecture by Stillman that um, it's called Stillman conjecture that um, if uh, if your collection Q i through Q c are uh, uh, bound are all polynomials of bounded degree. Then, um, then actually you can do better than um, there exists uh, uh, an S depending only on D and C such that the ideal generated by Q1 through QC is projective of dimension at most S. And um, uh, so this is, this is the flavor. I give this as an example. This example attracted recent attention because the answer is yes. So this is the conjecture in the a theorem now of Ananya and Hofstel um, from 2016. Um, 
Uh, but this is this kind of demonstrates the flavor of the, the results I'm interested in. So I'm interested in things that happen that remain stable as the as the number of variables grow. Um, okay. Uh, right. So um, so here is the second example, and this this is basically one of the things I want to talk about today, and it's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, is the following. Um, so here is kind of an uh, uh, an easy algebraic fact is that uh, if you have a vector space over a field K and um, uh, and you have a subspace W, then if you have a polynomial from W to K, so F is a polynomial of degree A, then it's very easy to extend it to a polynomial on B. So there exists a polynomial P from B to K such of the same degree, such that the restriction of P to W is this original function F you started with, or polynomial F you started with. Right, this is very easy. Um, but here is a, here's a kind of a modification of this question that you can ask. Um, so suppose you have um, X is a degree D hypersurface. So for example, if D equals two, then um, you just look at the, all the points X with, you have some Q, some quadratic form. So I have a quadratic form in N variables over here. And I look at the X is the, the, the locus of this, uh, of this quadratic form. And I can ask the, the following of a modified question or the following question. Um, suppose I have a, a function F from X to K. So F is not defined on V, it's just an arbitrary, not an arbitrary, sorry, not an arbitrary. So it's a function from X to K that, that satisfies the following condition. I call it weakly polynomial function of degree A. What does that mean? It means that for any subspace inside X, if I restrict it to that subspace, then it's a polynomial of degree A. So clearly if, uh, if X were a, a hypersurface, a hyperplane, then, then this would be like the previous easy example. And obviously uh, uh, I could just take the, I could just take the, that hyper, uh, the hypersurface, uh, the hyperplane itself. Anyway, so this is, I call this a weakly polynomial function. So I'll say it again. So weakly polynomial, because this will fall, that we need to kind of uh, understand this definition because it will be with us for some time then uh, that means that for any, for any subspace inside X, um, the restriction of F uh, is a polynomial of degree A, okay? And um, of course, uh, there might be no uh, subspaces inside X, then this, doesn't, this is an empty condition. <clears throat> but, but you can still ask the question, um, is, uh, uh, is it, or when, under which conditions, or does there exist a polynomial um, v, uh, from V to K, uh, polynomial of degree A, such that um, the restriction of P to X is this uh, original uh, function F you, you started with. I'm really, I'm calling it a function, not, a, it's not, I don't know that it's a polynomial. So it's just, you can think of it as it's a function that is, or, or a collection of data on subspaces inside X. So the data you're given, the function F is only defined on X, or actually you can think of it as only interesting on subspaces inside X. And if none such subspaces exist, then there's nothing to say, uh, or not nothing to say, uh, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, and this is the data you're given. So I can't say that it's, I, it's a polynomial, it's just a function. Uh, and I'm asking whether, whether it's a restriction of polynomial um, or under what condition would it be a restriction of polynomial? So the, maybe the first answer is, is, is no. Um, even, uh, 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 in, um, even in algebraically closed fields, even if, or even if you, even, even if you, well, you could have some, some varieties that have, uh, that, have that, that, satis that have functions that satisfy this condition, but um, for example, here's an example. So suppose you have uh, the polynomial Q in two variables, Q, X, Y is X times Y times X minus Y. And, uh, and you're looking at the, well, it should be Q of X, Y equals zero for X, Q. Um, you see, maybe uh, annotate. Does this work? Ah, <laughs> okay. I'm so used to the iPad that, uh, uh, it should be Q, X, Y here. I was trying to press the screen, but nothing happened. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, so, uh, uh, so this should be Q of X, Y over here. 
Um, and maybe, right, I should delete this. Otherwise, it remains for all further slides, I think. Uh, anyway, um, and then, so, so consider this, this variety. So it's, uh, so Q of X, Y, the variety, the X, Q is just a collection of three lines. So it's a line X equals zero, Y equals zero, and X equals Y. And, and look at the function that is uh, zero on the two, on the two axes, and, and, and X zero and zero Y, but on X, X, it's X, then um, clearly this function is, uh, um, well, I didn't write the, the, I thought I wrote. So clearly this function is weakly linear because restricted to any line, it is uh, restricted to any subspace inside X. So the subspaces inside X here are the lines and so restricted to any line, this is a linear function, but, uh, but definitely you can't extend it to a, a globally linear function on, uh, on, uh, on the two-dimensional vector space and V squared because, uh, um, because it has to be, ha because if you could, it would have to be zero, right? Because it's zero on the two, on the two lines, X equals zero and Y equals zero. So, so clearly, clearly this is, this is as, as a general, without any conditions, you can't expect anything, uh, anything to happen. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, so, so again, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm defining the, giving this definition again. Again, I said that a function is weakly polynomial of degrees small or equal than a for any affine subspace. Um, the restriction of f to w is a polynomial of degrees small or equal than a. So this is what I call a weakly polynomial function. And um, suppose I'm given a collection of polynomials q1 through qc in um, uh, in n variables, so in over a field k, so k in, of x1 through xn, and again I look at the locus of this collection of polynomials, and I'll say that this variety xq has property star a if for if for any if for any weekly or if for any weekly polynom polynomial of degree smaller or equal than a, um, I can find an extension. I can find a true polynomial on the entire V of degree A, such that its restriction is F. Okay, so I'll call, a, I'll call this, I'll, I'll, I'll give it as a, as a property of the variety. Um, and, uh, uh, and if I fix A and D, I'll say that a field K is A, D admissible if it's either algebraically closed or it's finite and contains a subgroup of size greater than A, D. So really, um, it's just, I, you, you can forget this definition. Everything I'm going to say is going to be true for either algebraically closed field or finite fields with this condition, but um, maybe I just, instead of writing admissible in many places, I just delete, just forget the condition on the, on the finite field. It's a technical condition. I'll say exactly where it comes in the picture. <clears throat> okay, so, so you can sort of forget, forget the condition, this admissibility, you don't need to keep this in mind, just keep in, what you should keep in mind is kind of an algebraically closed or finite field, okay? These are the results I'll talk about will be true in this context. And, and, and this, is a, this is a theorem that, uh, that, um, that we proved uh, together with Kashtan. So all this work is joint work uh, with David Kashtan. Um, and it's the following, so if you fix A and D, and K is either algebraically closed or a finite field with this condition, then um, there exists an R, some integer R that depends on the parameters A, D, and C, such that um, for any collection of C polynomials, QI, so QI are in the ring of N variables, and you see that R doesn't depend on N, so this is true for any N. Um, so long, and if all the degrees of the QIs are small or equal than D, um, then this is not enough. We already saw a counterexample. Uh, but this extra condition, I call it the NC rank is greater than R. Under this extra condition that I will describe in detail in a minute, then the variety XQ has property star A. So, so, um, so now I want to spend some time on, on, describing, uh, on describing this condition under which we can, so again, what will, will this say that a variety having this property um, will satisfy that any weakly polynomial function of degree smaller than or equal than a extends to a extends to a polynomial of degree smaller or equal than a on on the entire um, b. Okay. Any questions so far? I don't. Uh, 
I only see you, Alex. So if you have questions, I'll know. <laughs> I see your face, but uh, if there's, uh, I hope the setting is kind of clear. Anyway. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the rank. This is this is kind of the, the kind of the central notion of this talk is is around this notion of rank. So I'll spend some time on it. Um, so what is rank? So, um, so suppose you have a, a, a polynomial Q and n variables, and it's of degree d. Um, say d is greater than one, and uh, then we say that the rank of Q is it's the minimal r, so that I can write Q as the sum of products of SI, RI, um, where SI and RI are both of degree that is strictly smaller than the degree of Q, in this case, D, okay? So, um, so I, I say that Q, the, the rank of Q is the minimal R so that Q has a representation as a sum of R products of two polynomials of, um, of strictly smaller degree than the degree of Q. And, when d equals one, for, for d equals one, we say that the rank of q is infinite if it's, uh, and, and for d equals zero, it's zero, okay? So, so linear polynomials are of infinite rank and constant polynomials are of zero rank. Um, and it, the definition makes sense for, starts making sense for, for polynomials of degree greater than one. And, and then there's this nc rank that was in the previous slide. So, Usually in many, in, in, okay, so let me, let me finish by, so, so, so if you have a polynomial of degree D, then, um, then you can associate to it a, a, a symmetric D tensor by, um, so you take this polynomial and you differentiate it, um, you differentiate it uh, uh, D times. So I wrote down what the differentiation is. So, so delta H of Q is Q of X plus H minus Q of X. And if I apply this, if I apply this uh, uh, d times, then x is going to die because it was a degree d polynomial. So x is, right, if I take x plus h minus x, if it were a linear polynomial, then I would just be left with h. But if I take something quadratic, I would be left with a bilinear form in h1 and h2 and, and so on. So after, after I take, a, after I differentiate d times uh, in this form, then I'm left with a, a symmetric d tensor. And on b to the d, and um, I'll say that the nc rank of q, so it comes from non-classical, and I'll say in, in a minute why, um, I'll say that the nc rank of q is the rank of q tilde, okay? So, um, so instead of measuring the rank of q, I'll measure the rank of q tilde, and here is the comment that, that I wanna say is that um, if the character, if you're only interested in large characteristic, you don't care about what happens in small characteristic, then you can just work with regular rank, and that's fine. Um, but if you're, uh, if you're interested in what happens in high characteristic, in low characteristic, okay, in high char when characteristic is greater, of, the characteristic of your field is greater than D, then you can always recover your polynomial Q from this D tensor by the diagonal embedding. You can plug in just X's inside. So you can look at Q tilde of all the X's divided by D factorial. And, um, and then, uh, so, so from this, you always get that the rank of Q is smaller or equal than the non-classical rank of Q in the case when the characteristic is greater than D. And um, also there's an in easy inequality to the other direction, but actually this is not true in low characteristic. So in low characteristic, it could happen that you have a polynomial of degree, uh, a, a polynomial that is of high rank, and what, whereas after you differentiate it uh, in this form in D times, you end up with a low rank uh, polynomial. So if you don't care about low characteristic, you can just work with the regular notion of rank. But if you care about the, uh, if you care about high characteristic, if you, if you or or zero characteristic, that's fine. But if you care about um, finite, uh, non-zero, or small characteristic, then uh, um, then to make the results applicable in that case as well, you need to work with a rank of the symmetric form. Okay. Um, so maybe in some places, in some I, for, I forget to write N C, and I forgive me for that. But really, this is uh, uh, I want to. I, I did say that I would explain something of why why this uh, this N C. So why it comes from a uh, from uh, non classical. Um, it does involve in the in the low characteristic case. Uh, um, um, if uh, if you have a if you have some polynomial Q that is of uh, uh, 
that is of high rank, but its symmetric form is of low rank, then actually you can write your original polynomial. It's not of low rank. I said it's high rank, but it's, you, you can write it as, as a function of what is called kind of non-classical polynomials. So kind of creatures that are close to polynomials um, in the sense that after differentiated them d times you get uh, oh d plus one times if it's degree d non-classical polynomial they vanish but uh, um, but they're not in, in, in low characteristic um, you can have functions like this that are not genuine polynomials they don't take value in the field they take value in some you need to ex extend the ranges a bit but it still will uh, the Anyway, if somebody's interested in this, I can say something later. Anyway, I just explained the just explained the NC uh, the NC uh, um, remark over here. Uh, okay, so um, so uh, okay, so I start with uh, so again. So if uh, I, I want to define the the rank for a collection of polynomials, I define the rank of one polynomial. So let's define the rank of a collection of polynomials to be the minimal rank of any non-linear, linear, uh, non-trivial linear combination. So, um, so rank is depends on the polynomial. So, you have a collection of polynomials. You take a linear combination. You get some polynomial of some degree, and you measure the rank of this polynomial. Okay, rank. Remember, rank is rank is a, is a notion. I'm going quickly back. Is a notion that cares about the degree. Okay, it's for degree d polynomial. You need to write it as the sum of lower products of lower degree polynomials. Okay, so here are some, some remarks regarding this notion. So the first one is that uh, uh, if Q is, uh, say if Q is a product of two polynomials, then the rank is just one, okay, uh, of, of lower degrees, and this is just rank one. Um, if, um, if Q is a non-degenerate quadratic form, um, then, um, then its rank is somewhere between um, uh, uh, N over two and N, Right, if, if you can think of the examples of Q is the sum of Xi squared, this is I equals one to N, this would be rank N, and you can think of the sum of Xi minus Yi squared, I equals one to N, this will give you rank N over two, right? I have two N variables or rank N, rank for, for, for two, anyway, I hope I, I hope I, for two and N, or for N, N over two. Um, so, so this is, so, so this is kind of a, uh, this is maybe uh, an explanation for for um, for the case uh, for the case d equals two. There, are all kinds of kinds of notions of rank sort of um, fall to the same kind of notion of rank of a matrix, of rank of a quadratic form. But when you have more more uh, uh, when your degree is higher than um, than uh, than actually you can extend in many ways the notion of rank. Um, I'm not going to define the other notions, so but probably many of you are, are familiar with the notion of tensor rank. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm just <laughs> sticking to this notion of rank. I'm just saying that there are others that extend the notion of rank. And I'll, I'll try to sell to you, I, I will try to convince you why this is a really good notion of rank, this, uh, the rank that, that, that is defined here. And um, uh, in, algebraic uh, in algebraic geometry, this, uh, this, the notion I, this notion of rank, it, they call it strength. And actually, um, this is, this notion or this, this property or this notion was, was what was used by Ananian and Hochstel to prove uh, uh, the Stillman conjecture. So this, this notion of strength, of rank, it's the same. Um, in analytic number theory, um, this is kind of well known for a long time ago. It's called this notion, it's called the Schmidt H invariant. But, uh, but the people in analytic number theory were normally um, they didn't care about stability in the number of variables. So they have like very good bounds, maybe depending on D and on the characteristic P or so, something like that, but they don't, they, they're, 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 the results are always, always um, also um, depend on the number of variables. So they were not, when this was studied by Schmidt and others, then, then, um, then they weren't interested in the, in the phenomena of stability in the number of variables. And uh, maybe a kind of a last, a last thing, uh, a last uh, a property is, uh, is this uh, um, recent result of Kashtan and me that um, we actually also are able to connect this to, to give this kind of a geometric interpretation. So if, uh, if you denote by S of Q bar, the co-dimensional of the singular locus of, uh, of Q bar, Q 
bar is the collection Q1 through QC. Um, then, um, then we can show that, uh, uh, that the non-classical rank or rank in, in the general, in, in the high characteristic case, is, uh, gives a lower bound for the, um, for the co-dimension of the singular locus. So, um, so also has, but this is not, okay, um, I'm not going to talk about this at all. This is a, a rather technical, um, rather technical result anyway, but it's subject of a completely different, uh, different talk. Anyway, so, so I just wanted to say, so first of all, this, this notion was studied by various, in, in various other um, uh, fields, so it's like in algebraic geometry and analytic number theory, and also um, very, uh, this relation to the singular locus makes it, uh, uh, is, is kind of another, another reason to, to, uh, um, to view it as a, a, a somehow kind of a, also maybe a geometric notion um, but here is okay. So, uh, so, so I hope I, I slightly convinced you that this is uh, this is an interesting notion. But wait, wait for it. It's kind of well, the the key reason is going to come soon. Um, but here, here are some proper. So here is kind of a, an essential property of uh, high rank varieties that uh, um, uh, that I I'll set it for uh, for hypersurfaces. Okay. So suppose you have a. a uh, a, a k vector space and q is some polynomial of degree d and if you look at xq is this hypersurface that is uh, uh well over here i didn't even look at xq okay anyway um you look at a polynomial of degree d and we say that uh that q is m universal if um for any choose okay fix m so it's m universal fix m and choose your favorite polynomial r and m variables of degree d, same degree as q, then um, I'll say that q is m universal if I can find a map, an affine map from k to the m to v, such that I can, r is q composed with v, so I can, um, maybe, okay, so I can think of it as, um, think of the variety, so think of the, the variety given by the locus of q, and you have this the section you choose your variety and you see it as a section of of your of your uh, of your high rank variety uh, sorry the section of this m universal um, variety associated of uh, the m universal polynomial or variety associated to hypersurface associated to the m universal variety m universal polynomial sorry it's very hot here <laughs> so, um, especially that I closed the door Anyway, so uh, so here is a here is one of the key properties that we have for uh, for high rank varieties and and uh, is is kind of a cornerstone to to many of the things we do is the following is that um, there is there exists an R depending on D only on D okay in the case of hypersurfaces only in D otherwise it would depend on um, D one through D C the degrees of the polynomials or or of Q1 through QC if you have a collection of Q polynomials, but this is, I just stated for hypersurface, but it's true for any collection. Then, uh, um, then for, any, for any field K that is either finite or algebraically closed, and so you don't need the condition on the size of the field here, and any Q with a, a non-classical rank greater than R, so again, in the, low, in the high characteristic case, you can just write rank greater than R, then, then it's M universal. Okay, so so again, what does M universal mean? It means that if you um, if you choose your favorite favorite polynomial R and M variables, then um, oh, you see that there is something very wrong here. I hope <laughs> I hope you I hope you if if someone is still uh, is, is still is still there, then uh, then you see that this is complete can't be true because uh, R should depend on M as well. Okay, so if, right, if I take, if I take uh, M to have more variables than, than Q, then clearly there's no chance that something like I could be, I should, I can do something like this. So, so it should be there exists an R that depends on N and an M. Tami, I think the, you have two M's here and one of them you insisted that things should not depend on the number of variables. Right, n is the number of variables. So, so that's a, there is an n in the background, little n, and little n is, as, is the dimension of this v, 
And I'm sorry. everything yeah. here is independent of that. I'm sorry, yeah, okay, thanks. You're thanks. right, but you're right to say that, and you're right, both, you're both right that this is missing from, 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 from here, but basically the, the result, the theorem here is true for any vector space. So for any V, for any Q that is of sufficiently high rank is M universal. Okay, so, but the rank has to, this is very important. So this thing should have I, an M here as well. Okay, not only the D, D of course matters too, but, uh, but the M here is crucial as well. Okay. okay. Question. Yeah. So do you have any lower uh, estimates on RDM? Do you know how large it grows or? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, oh. How, uh, how th th this is, yeah, I do. And <laughs> I do and, uh, uh, and this is, I do and this is my selling point for this, for, for, for this notion of rank is the fact that, that you can get good bounds for it. Okay. But Great. I don't know who asked it actually, so. <laughs> Um, anyway, there's, this, is, this, is a, uh, this is a serious drawback in this format, I think, is that you can't see the faces of the people that you're talking to. So anyway, um, okay. So, so this is, this is a, a key property. Um, uh, I need to erase these, right? This stays forever. Okay. Um, so, so general method of proof of, of so I, I, everything I state, I tell you it's true for finite fields and for algebraically closed fields. And, and the general method of proof is always um, the following. So you prove, a, 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 you prove a result for finite fields. Um, that's kind of where analysis comes in. So I'll describe the tools for this in a minute. So you prove a result in finite fields. And then, um, um, and then quite quickly you can derive it for algebraically algebraic closure of finite fields. But the, the key thing is kind of then use model theory to prove it for any algebraically closed field using this key classical results from model theory that um, if you have T is the theory of algebraically closed field, then any first order property in T, which is true for the algebraic closure of finite fields is also true for algebraically all algebraically closed fields. So, um, so basically, what is how how does the theme? I'll I'll try. I hope I have time. So I, I I hope I have time to demonstrate how this works in a simple example, um, and how it works for in, in a simple example that demonstrates the way we use it. Um, but basically, uh, there is a kind of an analysis that goes to to the proof in finite fields, and then uh, and then. If you manage to, to, you have, it doesn't follow automatically. I can't say that the result as is follows from, 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 this, from this result in model theory. But what I have to do is kind of dissect the, the, the parts in my proof and each one of them I can use this, theory, this theorem to, to, um, to, to, make a, to make valid for algebraically closed fields as well, for general algebraically closed fields. Okay, so I hope I, I'll, dem I'll try, uh, hopefully, I'll have uh, I can I'll be able to demonstrate how this is done. Um, but uh, but let me let me say uh, something about okay. So here is a so the first I said the first thing uh, comes from this uh, uh, the key analytic the key technical tool that is why rank is a very good notion. Um, it's an algebraic notion, but it's very good in the sense that in finite fields it can be measured analytically. And what do I mean by that? is um, the following theorem in the form that I'm stating it, it's due to Baumik, Lovic, and Lovic, and Milicevic, but I'll, there's a big space of white on the bottom and I'll describe to you the history of this and, and, and then uh, and, and what kind of versions of this theorem there are. Um, so, um, so what does the theorem say? So um, you give me S, so let S be greater than zero, then um, there exists a rank, there exists an R, number that depends on the, the on D and S. So D is always the degree for me. So you can always, if you see D, know that it's degree. So it's gonna be a degree of something. Then um, you have an R that depends on D and S, such that for any field K, uh, finite field K, say size Q, and, and any K vector space B, and um, Q a polynomial from V to K of degree D, 
then if um, the non-classical rank of Q is greater than R, then um, for any non-trivial additive character chi, so for any non-trivial additive character chi from B to C star, so chi of X plus Y is chi of X times chi of Y, um, it's unbiased. If I look at this average, I look at the average over the points in B of chi of Q of B, then, um, oh, this shouldn't be from, uh, um, from V, <laughs> sorry. I don't know why, you know, I'm reading this, thinking this uh, doesn't make sense. So this should be, chi should be from, um, um, from the field K to C star, okay? So Q of V takes values in K, this is another, I swear I read these very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and still, uh, still, there are so many uh, mistakes. Um, it should be chi is a non-trivial character from from the field K on the a character on the field K. And if I look at this character and I evaluate it at Q of V, and I average over all the points, so I sum over V and V and divide by the size of V. So I average over all points in V. Then this is, uh, and there should be an absolute value also. Uh, um, then, um, then this thing is smaller than, uh, uh, than Q to the minus S. Okay. Um, and, um, okay. I'll say, so this kind of, this kind of thing, if you, if you think about it, if you have a kind of an, uh, an estimate like this, then it's very, um, it makes it, um, easy for you, or at least doable for you, to count points, to count the points where Q vanishes, or count points in, in the variety defined by Q, or count lines, kinds, two-dimensional subspaces. If you want to count anything you want to count, um, this kind of, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, theorem allows you to count them uh, with, uh, uh, in a good way, depending on how good your quantitative bounds on the rank and S are. Okay, so, so it really depends, depends on how Good this is and here's okay so here's a little bit of the history so um so the the first uh uh so a, a first version of this proof theorem was proved by a green and tau in 2007 um and they proved uh but they proved okay they proved the result for finite fields for uh prime fields of characteristic greater than d but this is this I'm not so worried about, but their rank there depended on k and to make any of our results work we need the rank to be, this R to be independent of K. Otherwise, there is no way we can take things through extensions. So, so, um, so the, first, the first result, the first result with Green and Tau had a dependence on K, and then there was a, a result by Kaufman and Lovett in 2008, where they um, deleted the, the, the condition on, on the characteristic. Um, and then, um, and then there was a, okay, so the first, the first result that is kind of an, of interest to us is that of Baumwick and Lovett from 2015, where they got rid of the dependence in K, um, but it was not quantitative. So it was as in the form that I stated here. So, so the, re the result I state here is actually the result of Baumwick and, Baumwick and Lovett. Um, but then um, last year, um, Milicevic, I hope I'm spelling his name correctly. Maybe I'm missing another uh, one of these lines. Um, prove that actually uh, uh, kind of very good quantitative bounds on R and dependence on the, the, the dependence of R, good quantitative bounds for the dependence of uh, R on S. So R of DS is some constant depending on D times S to some other constant depending on D. And the way I understand it, okay, so for people coming from additive combinatorics and where these kind of theorems um, are people were interested in applications of, of, of this, this bias rank theorem, then um, they didn't really care about the dependence in K so much, actually, um, but rather, rather really um, the dependence in S is what was critical. Um, so, uh, but for, as I said, for, the, I, I wanna make this point kind of crucial for, for the applications, if you wanted for the applications to, to, uh, to uh, general algebraically closed fields, then, um, then you have to get rid of the dependence of, of K here. And I also understand that some, many people are interested also in the dependence in D, and the dependence in D is not as good. In this theorem, the dependence in D, I think 
C of D is maybe triply exponential and D of D is doubly exponential or, or, or something like this, but the dependence in S is very good. And I should also mention that um, independently um, of Milicevic, Janser proved uh, a result that is similar to, to Milicevic, a same kind of bound, but it did depend weakly on, on K. There is kind of a log Q that appears somewhere there. So once again, although from an additive combinatorics point of view, this doesn't matter. Um, this dependence of K on K is, is, is not important, but, uh, but actually from, um, from, my point, from, from the point of view of, of where, I'm, where, where I want to take this is actually is a bit is crucial. Um, okay. So this is uh, this is this is a uh, this is for the history of this and um, and uh, maybe a, a, a question. Um, I think David Kashtan thinks it should. I don't know if this is true. No, I, I will have no. I don't have good intuition for this. But whether we can have d the dependence in s can it be linear in s? So there is a question whether whether uh, whether d d of d can be actually one. Um, okay, I just leave it there. Uh, but but as, as I said, the key, this is kind of the key technical tool that we want to use. And, and, and the point is that it allows you, if you have this kind of thing, since you always can use Fourier analysis to count, to, to if you sum over the characters, you, you, to some points over, uh, over um, some, to, to count points on your variety, or not only points, you want to count various, ob various algebraic objects, points, lines, subspaces, arithmetic progressions, anything you want to count. Um, this kind of theorem allows you to do in a very efficient way. Okay, so uh, so here is a so so I want to so here is a, uh, I want to describe to you how we prove this polynomial extension theorem um, that I described at the beginning. So I'm reminding you what the theorem. Okay, so what is so we have a, but I describe it just for hypersurface for, for for to make it more simple. So um, in notation, easier on the eyes. Uh, so um, so, so, so suppose you have Q is, is, a, is a, some polynomial of degree D and XQ is this hypersurface associated to Q. And we say that XQ has property star A, um, as I said before, if, and only, if for any function, uh, which is weakly polynomial of degree A, there, it extends to a true polynomial of degree A. Okay, this is, uh, this is the property. And I wanna show that if X is of sufficiently high rank, then, um, then, then XQ has property star A, okay? But I wanna prove it first for finite fields. So how can I prove this for finite fields? Well, well the proof goes through three steps. Um, the first step is uh, actually works for any field. So um, any field, but it, it, this is, the first step works for any field, but it demands this condition of having um, that technical condition on the size of K that I wrote at the beginning. So um, so what is the first step is, first of all, you try to construct some family of hypersurfaces for which this property is true. So in this case, um, you can take the, the you can take a, the, the, the hypersurfaces defined by the polynomials RM, which are these really symmetric polynomials. So this is a sum over, it's a polynomial in M times D, ver in, sorry, in, um, yeah, m times d variables, okay? So I have xi1, xi2 up to xid, and i ranges between one and m. So this is, this is each one of these terms is a, 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 is a unique set of variables, okay? But this is a very symmetric polynomial, and it has, you can use its symmetries and representation theory to show that this polynomial, this surface, the hypersurface associated to these polynomials rm have this property that you can extend um, you can extend functions from them. So this is the first, this, this is the first step. Okay, and this is, this works for any, the construction works for any, for any algebraic, any field. Um, but uh, under this, I said this technical condition that I said before. But the step two is kind of the first thing, the first place where rank comes in the picture. So I said, I, I wanted to, construct before I constructed a family of hypersurfaces of growing rank. So, our M has rank M, and these, 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 uh, or at least M, um, I think exactly M. This, uh, um, um, 
yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. This, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this collection, this collection of polynomials is of growing rank. This is going to play an important role in, in, in a minute. So it's not enough for me to know that this holds for one hypersurface. I need to have a, a growing family of hypersurfaces for which this is, for which the property is known. And okay, this is the first step. And the second step is, um, this is where the sections theorem comes in. If I know that um, for any M, if uh, for any fixed M, if Q, Q is in N variables, lots, millions of variables, okay? Q is in, in, in this, if for any Q, which is, of sufficient high rank. So sufficient high rank already will tell you that you would have to have at least that many variables, okay? So when you have, when you, when you say this condition of having high rank, it already gives you implicitly a condition on the, on a minimum on the condition on kind of a lower bound for the number of variables you need for Q. Um, so, but if Q is of sufficiently high rank, then by the sections theorem, um, you can find uh, a linear map, an affine linear map phi, such that Q composed with phi is exactly this polynomial Rm. So I don't really know who Q is and what the hypersurface associated to Q is, but I do know that um, if you, you fix Rm, then I can hit it as a, as a section in, of my, my hypersurface. And, and now the third step is um, is to show that uh, um, if you have any variety that is of sufficiently high rank, so if y is a rank of, depending on d, okay, so this, this, this uh, if y, I, I will apply this to the variety rm. So if rm, if m is sufficiently large, depending on d, okay, so Step three, if I, I will apply step three for ym. So you can think of, it says there ym, and it says that if ym is a rank, there is some r that depends only on d, that if ym is a rank of great, is a rank that is greater than rd, and y is um, the intersection of x with a hyperplane. Okay, so I want, so, okay, let me, let me say it to the end and then I'll explain it. So Y is the intersection of X with a hyperplane, then if star A holds for Y, then I can push it forward to X. Okay, and then, and then how can I, how can I complete, I, I, how can I can complete the, the proof? Then I, I choose M so that YM is of rank rate greater than this RD that I have over here. And then choose Q to be a rank that is greater than R of the M that was good for the RD in step three and D, okay? So I, I, I do this rank thing twice. First I take M to satisfy, so that YM satisfies step three, and then I take Q of sufficiently high rank with respect to the M of step three and D of step two. And now I take so so I have this I have my variety and I have this section where where I see where I see this y m for for which I know my property, but now I can I I take a flag, and to to exhaust in the end to to reach all the way up to x and it says here there's no condition on n here and there's no there's only a condition on r and I when I when I go when I rank doesn't doesn't decrease when you go up it only decreases if you if you, take a, if you take a polynomial and you restrict it to a subspace, then the rank can decrease, but it can't increase. So if your high rank on, on if, if your intersection with, with this, if your section, the original section you have in section two was high rank, then it keeps on being high rank through the, when you go up through the flag. So the same, the, of, of at least the same rank. So condition three remains valid for going through the entire steps of your flag. And then, uh, uh, and then you induct to get uh, to get that actually you know this uh, that this actually holds for uh, for your entire uh, for x. Okay, um, and maybe maybe I should just say so. What is so? There are two steps here that use rank kind of heavily. Um, the first step doesn't use rank at all, but the second step is this section theorem that says that you can hit any variety you want as a section of your variety. And, and the third step says that if you that if you're of sufficiently high rank, then you can extend to to if you're 
you can extend one step up. You can kind of extend if you're in an in intersection of some uh, W, if, if you're in intersection with a hyperplane. And, and what is the key, what is the key, what is the flavor of, of the proof of step three is something like, um, well, Suppose your y is um, y is x, the, the intersection of x with a let, uh, let's denote w t the the lev level sets of some linear function l of x equals t. Okay, so w zero is exactly your 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 hyperplane w, and you know the theorem for w zero, so intersection with x. So this is y, and you want to extend it through. You want to inductively extend it to to the to to all the to extend through all the wts. You have some weakly polynomial function. You want to extend it to to all the other um, level sets of uh, of this linear function. And the key to doing that is this kind of property again that high rank varieties have. That if you choose a line inside w to the intersection of w t and x so choose some t so i would say i know it for zero i want to prove it for one okay for some some value of t in the field k and choose a choose a, a, a take a line inside w t intersection in, in x then it's true that almost any line there it's not it's not a statement that is true always it's a statement this is a kind of typical to high rank varieties many of the statements they're not true always they're true typically so for almost any line, you can find a parallel line inside W intersection with X. And, and then you can use that, you can use uh, uh, the fact that your polynomial vanishes on, uh, uh, that, you're, that you're a polynomial on planes to, to kind of extend your, your function to, to WT as well. I didn't write the exact, uh, the, 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 the exact uh, uh, way to deduce this, but I do want to stress the kind of flavor of, I want to explain the flavor of, uh, of, of the type of thing that happen in high rank varieties. So this is something like number, step number three is or also in a step number two, but it's not gonna be true for any, without any condition. So it's not, for example, here is, a, here is kind of a property that, that, that high rank varieties have and, and not true in general. So suppose you have a, um, a high rank variety and you have some point in your vector space and you ask whether you can write it as a sum of two points inside your, your variety x and if x if under no condition this is not always true so you can't do well you not only on the under all conditions so typically what you can say is that almost well you, under no conditions you you can't necessarily do this but um but even under high rank what you can do is say something like for almost every point you can find two points such that x is a sum of two points inside your variety. Like over here, almost any line has a parallel line or something like that. So typically, typically the, the kind of statements you can prove are proofs are, 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 are this type, kind of an almost, um, um, an almost sure. Um, so what is almost, almost any for me is something that depends, right? It's there, it's a, you have to play with this, uh, with this uh, uh, quantitative measurement of rank. So with this bias rank uh, uh, thing, is this a, so? So this is um, my my next. Uh, uh, how how am I doing? Ah, uh, not too far. So I uh, <laughs> not too much left. I, I next wanted to accept a kind of a given example for how to a scheme, kind of the proof scheme of how to deduce from something like this. How do you deduce this thing in the uh, the results for algebraically closed fields? But I want to ask first if this is kind of well understood. Or maybe to some extent. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay. So 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 I want to give an example of how um, of or like not I would, I'm not going to show how to how to how to produce how to um, show that theorem that I said it before this uh, this extension theorem how to derive it for algebraically closed fields from finite fields but I want to give an example of how to derive a, another theorem which is simpler. Um, but just to explain the idea, and the same type of, of philosophy works uh, works in 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 our case as well. Um, so my notation is: uh, is there a name for this x double x for this? Is there a name for this? I don't know. Um, so I have a, a scheme, the scheme x defined over k. And x is uh, its n notation. I don't know if this is standard or not. So I don't. I'm I'm a bit off my. Uh, 
off my specialty here. So, so X, X are the, the K points of, uh, of, uh, of the scheme X. I don't know how to call that letter. Um, and here is, a, here is a, uh, an example of a theorem that you can prove for high rank varieties, for, for high rank polynomials. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to explain how, how you can get it through, but, but it demonstrates really what, what the, the flavor of the arguments that uh, of, translate, of how to translate our type of arguments to, to make them work uh, in general. So, so the, I, I call it the irreducible fiber theorem, IFT for, 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 uh, for short, for, this, for these two slides, two coming slides. For any, for any K, um, K vector space V and any polynomial Q of degree D and rank greater than D, all the fibers of ft all the fibers ftq so t is a point in k um are irreducible varieties um well i'll, I'll write what ftq is in a minute or oh, irreducible varieties of dimension um dim v minus one okay so i i i changed the order of the notation and theorem maybe that was a mistake um so here's kind of the notation is that um I have the, the affine line A and the K points. And I, I have to, I have a variety divide, defined over the field K, but now I have this, I have a, a scheme defined over the field K, but I'm going to be interested in, in, in points and extensions of, of K. So, um, so thereby the, thereby the notation. Um, so, so you see the notation below and, and, and basically I'm interested FTQ is, uh, uh, if you have a polynomial Q, then I have a, uh, associated morphism between, um, I don't know how to call it. Surely there is a name for this. From, from, from the scheme V to the scheme A, maybe this. Uh, uh, and and uh, I'm looking at the fibers, at, at the fibers of this map. So FTQ is the fiber um, Q minus one um, of T. And it kind of generally, um, almost all fibers, it, it's kind of a, a, a general, fact in algebraic geometry is that almost all fibers are irreducible varieties of dimension dim v minus one. But actually, if your variety is high rank, then this is true for all fibers. So just an example that this doesn't have to be true for all fibers. So if you take q, x, y is x, y plus one, then, then f, t, q is irreducible for t that is not one, but it's not irreducible for f1. So if x, y plus one equals one, then it's a, I have two irreducible components. Um, okay, so so what is the scheme? Um, um, uh, okay, two minutes. Good, interesting. Uh, so what is the scheme of the proof? Well, the, the thing is that you, you first you want to prove this theorem. So so you start by proving this theorem for finite fields. So the the way you do this is this through this theorem of Vale that tells you Vale 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 that tells you that if you want to if you want to know how many irreducible components you have then basically you need to count points on the extensions. You need to, you need to count, calculate this tau LX, which is um, uh, the number of points, what you expect, the number of points in, in, of X in, in an extension KL and divided by the expected number or by the, the Q to the ML if the dimension is M. And um, so this is, this, is, this is how you can, you can count the number of irreducible components. And in our case, we're given this polynomial Q defined over K, and we can count the, the, the size of the, this finer field, we can count the, the size of the fibers. And I told you that for high rank varieties, it's very easy to, not be easy, but the bias rank theorem really gives you a count. So bias rank tells you that if you're of sufficiently high rank, then um, for any T in K to the L, in, in, in KL, in, in the extension, like L extension, then, um, um, then the number, um, then the size of the fiber is exactly what you want. It's like the Q, the, the A, not the, the normalized size. A of T minus Q to the minus L is smaller than say Q to the minus three L, doesn't matter. It should be smaller than maybe Q to the minus two L would be good enough here. So, so it automatically tells you, well, it automatically tells you that this tau L is gonna be one. So you have the count, in each extension, the count is right. So the, the, the error you have when L goes to infinity is of size Q to the minus three L or maybe something like that. So you get the correct count up to, up to an error of Q to the minus three L, which goes to zero as L goes to infinity. Okay, so, 
uh, so, so, so you have a good count of points over extensions, and then you can immediately deduce this for, uh, for, for algebraically, algebraic closure of, uh, of finite fields, just because an algebraic closure is the union of these finite fields. So basically, for each time you can reduce this to a finite, to a finite calculation, um, any fiber you fix, it's, it's already in one of these FQ, FQ to the L to the B. To, oh, Q to the N, doesn't matter. N is, okay, I, I should have written Q to the L there, doesn't matter. Um, and, and finally, uh, uh, and with this I end, so <laughs> with this I end, is finally you state, uh, you reformulate, I, I won't uh, just leave it as a slide, you reformulate your property as a, as a, as a property, as a first order uh, property, and then, um, and then the fact that you know it for, for, uh, uh, for closure of, uh, uh, for algebraic closure of finite fields automatically implies that it's true for, um, for, uh, for all algebraically closed fields. And, and you can see that I, I, I wanted to demonstrate this because this is really the fact, I'm, I'm quickly, this, I'm finishing by this, I'm quickly skim, skipping back to this theorem. You see step two and step three, these are the, these are the steps I need to translate into this kind of language. And, and really um, step two says that I can hit any polynomial. It's not, step two actually says more than that. Not only can I hit any RM, but all the RMs are hit at approximately the same the fibers, the fibers are, are of the same size. So, so this is step two. And step three is, is really, you can look at the variety of those lines. You can look at the lines which are not, um, uh, which, are, which don't satisfy the property and bound the codimension of, of, uh, uh, of these, uh, um, uh, of, the bad, of the bad sets, of the bad, uh, bad set of lines or something like that. In the, in the same way, you bound it, you give a bound that depends on Q to the minus S or something like that, and then, and then, uh, and then you can you can carry this further to to uh, um, to the algebraic algorithm. I'm done. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that, thank you very much. We we can we can have applause in a in, in a minute or two, but but first maybe are there are there any questions? So every, everyone can um, unmute themselves if they want to to ask questions. I didn't stop in the middle to ask if there were questions almost at all. Maybe that was a, a, a mistake, but. Maybe I could ask one quick question to start. So you have these, these two notions of rank, the, the rank and then the non-classical rank. Yeah. And you said the non-classical rank in general is larger. Um, yeah. Is there any bound in the other direction? So can it be arbitrarily large? Is it bounded no, by a function? No, 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 no. No, so so if you what do you, so which one is which one can be what? So if you have a um, the it's always um, ask ask it again, right? So right. So if I have if you have a if you have a polynomial if you have a, a polynomial of some of of of, uh, uh, of of low rank and you differentiate it, then then you're gonna get this form that you're gonna get. You know, there's gonna be some constant depending on d, but it's not gonna be a much higher rank. Okay. But, okay. But, okay thanks. So, yeah. so yeah. Okay. Actually, if I may, I was also going to ask a question about the same thing. So I think one. So the obvious example of a high degree polynomial whose derivatives vanish immediately is x to any power of p, right? Yeah, but I want. Yeah, but I want to get right. But it's not this. Uh, do you want? Here is a. Oh, I can't. I wish I could share my screen, but I. I can't. <laughs> I. I was. I was planning on using my iPad and going back and forth between kind of a blackboard or something. But the the, the example is a, is an example that actually came back as kind of a. It was called when it came back when it came out. It came as as a, a counter example for the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms over the finite fields. And it turned out that it wasn't really a counter example, but really the conjecture wasn't stated correctly. But they, if you take a, if you, if you take an, ex, uh, for an, ex, hey, I'm busy. Sorry, coffee came. <laughs> this is not... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, if you take, uh, uh, if you take, I can't write it, but I'll write, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. So if you look at the polynomial um, in over F2 to the N, in N variable that it's of the form X, the sum over xi, xj, xk, xl, and the indices are rising. Okay, so one smaller or equal than i, smaller than j, smaller, none, the indices don't repeat. Okay, so you can show that over, you can show that this is a rank n 
this is a rank n polynomial as but if you differentiate it four times if you differentiate it four times it's a quad if it's a uh, quartic degree four polynomial if you differentiate it four times you end up with something of rank three you can write it as a as a, a sum of three products of bilinear forms in what characteristic in characteristic two so in, the minute the characteristic is greater than the degree, you can simply recover it very quickly. So this is you, you sure. via the diagonal embedding. But, but if you don't do that, if not, and kind of, kind of the thing about the thing in the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms over finite fields for, for low characteristic, really what comes in the picture are these. So if you, if you have a polynomial that is of high rank, but its symmetric form is low rank, then it's not true that it's a low rank because it's not, we said it's high rank, but it is, you can write, it's measurable with respect to, it's not exactly a polynomial, but it's measurable with respect to um, a small collection of what we call non-classical polynomials, which are kind of functions that satisfy the condition that they vanish after, after um, D time, differentiating D times. And in low characteristic, like in, in, in high characteristic, this is just regular polynomials, but in low characteristic, they can take, you can take a function like that and it would take, although your original function, some xi, xj, xk, xl, took values inside F2, you can, write, you can write it as a function of a small number of polynomials taking values in um, z mod 8z. <laughs> So you need to you need to you need to leave you need to leave z mod two z to z mod eight z, and then and then even though your original function is just defined it, it takes values in f two, the fact that its symmetric form has low rank implies that you can write it as a as a as a sum function, not a polynomial. Okay, measurable with respect to means it's a constant on the same level sets as this, this, this collection of polynomials. So, so of, of, a, of a small collection of, of these non-classical creatures that are very, not very far from polynomials, but they're not polynomials in the regular sense. And, and I don't have an, one of, one of the things I, that kind of bothers me with them is that I don't have an algebraic interpretation of them. And I don't, I don't understand what they, <laughs> what they are oh, <laughs> except great. for the fact that they show up i don't have kind of i don't understand i don't understand them yet right so i think you've answered my question amply even though i haven't asked it yet but uh what i was going to ask is whether i mean is whether you if you change if you take an intermediate definition of non-classical just counting all additive polynomials as having degree one and then products of them would have degree two and so on if that would be the same notion so i think you've Clearly answered that no, that there's something much more interesting and much newer going yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, maybe this is a, a, a good moment to invite everyone to unmute themselves. In fact, maybe I, I can even do it myself. I'll unmute everybody. Um, and uh, let's sort of overwhelm Zoom with a round of applause. Thank you very much.